Thailand, they're really strict. You have to be a Thai citizen, or a Thai citizen has to have a 50% a majority share in any building or business you have. There's a lot of horror stories for people who um, do this with their Thai girlfriend or their Thai wife or their Thai, a Thai business, and then they have some falling out of some kind, and the Thai business or girl or husband or whatever just goes, cool, get out of my business and house, because they have a majority share, so you it can screw you over that way. You've got to be careful about that. I've heard some real horror stories, and it's not just personally... Not just Thailand, but it's the one you hear the most, where there's like stories of like uh, Thai Thai partners to uh, expats just slowly poisoning their husbands and wives and shit to get rid of them because they've got the baby and they've got the house now and like they're they're secure, so they're like, oh yeah, we've got what I want, and they just kill off the guy in a kind of like or girl in like a kind of like subtle way but like that's by no means the majority i think a lot of it is just pushed forward by like people like to try and convince people not to go and live abroad because like people like governments don't like that you go out and live abroad you know like um it makes you harder to monitor let's be honest it makes it very difficult because the way governments work is if you go and live in another country so if I live in China, Britain doesn't know how much my earnings are because I'm not taking them all over to China, uh, all over to the UK, right? They see the income I put across, which is always conveniently less than I would have to pay tax on, and also because I can't put much more across because I have to live over here, right? So, um, yeah, like... Um, that, and the Chinese government doesn't exactly go, here's all of the data on these people. So, like, they don't talk that way. So, any surveillance done by another government is not necessarily, unless they have a previous deal, going to be given to, uh, you know, your home country's thing. So, if you're worried about surveillance and you're, like, big about the Snowden scandal, my advice would be just keep moving country because eventually it's going to be very hard and very expensive for people to be following you around and collecting all your information to the point that if you're not doing anything that makes you a person of interest to a secret service, they're not going to spend that much money. It's like the student loan service, for example. It would cost them nearly $20,000 to follow me around and track all of my earnings just to find that I've not earned enough money to pay off my student loan or to really ever, like, I owe them, like, another six pounds or something. It's like, it's not worth it. It's like, I don't, you know, that's how it works. But, like, I'm not saying, hey, guys, just evade tax or anything. I'm just saying, like, um, so, you know. But anyway, uh, my point being is you, property prices and property, the right to buy property changes place to place. So um, you can't just walk into Thailand and buy property. So I assumed a lot of Southeast Asia, because I think it's the same in Cambodia, but I'm not sure, don't quote me on that, doesn't just let foreigners go in and buy property either. Laos, I think, did at one point. Anyway, I'll get to the point in a minute. I've been looking at Vietnam for a while, because Vietnam property prices are really low. Most of that country is coast, and it's really nice weather, so I thought, you know what, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Nice little house on the beach, sit there, work on some motorbikes, that'd be great. Spare time kind of job, uh, spare time kind of hobby. Oh, I'm not allowed to buy property over there, and then lately, or well, I was reading anyway, a few places, they reckon lately you can actually, but it's like at a limited thing, you can't go over and buy you know, like, a load of property. You can buy, like, a few, or, like, one or two, which is enough for me, because it's like I'm not actually into property development. I'm looking for a place to live, you know? So I was like, oh, neat. I can go buy a property in Vietnam, and they're pretty cheap by our standards. Property price is weird, man. You think, oh, yeah, if you live in the UK, you think, oh, wow, that's really expensive. I'll never be able to afford a house as a millennial. Yay. 
I'm going to die with no fucking ability to do anything, like pay my rent and shit, because it's too expensive. Um, but actually, in other countries, it's way cheaper. And in some cases, more expensive. Depends on where you choose to go. Research stuff if you're going to go and just choose a place because you're like, oh yeah, it's cheaper to live here, so it'll be fine, because it might be more expensive in some attributes. It's really interesting because it's like, when you're thinking of your future, if you decide at some point, if you decide at some point, yo dog, I don't want to live in the UK, it's too expensive, or your home country, it's good to know that you have alternatives available, you know? Because in some cases you're just like, oh god, there's no alternative, and like if you're quite happy to stay at home, it's like, can be a challenge if you live in a country where the cost of living is so high, you know what I mean? See, I'm not really having any trouble with these guys, but it is early on. Anyway, that was not really dank or really interesting, except for me, I'm like, <laughs> I'm so excited, one day I can live in Vietnam, or maybe Japan, I guess, if I'm really wealthy. You know. To me, that's kind of interesting, but like, I don't know if it's the long term. The thing about teaching abroad is you actually got a lot of options and you get more the more experience and quals you have. So like, I've been offered jobs before where they were like, uh, hey, you'll be working in the middle of nowhere in the Dominican Republic. It's like literally the middle of nowhere. There's like hardly anything there. And they weren't paying much, but they were saying, oh yeah, like you can volunteer. It's basically like, the locals are paying for you to come and teach their students. It's a really poor area. I ended up turning it down because I was really nervous that my teaching skill was not equivalent enough, you know, because they were like, oh, you'll be looking after like year one and year two on your own and be the class teacher and be the everything teacher. And then a Spanish teacher will come in and teach them the mandated Spanish, but you're like there as the English teacher and the everything teacher, and I was just like, oh, I am not comfortable with that idea. Wow. Sometimes I go for them and they're not actually done yet. There we go. But you know, like, it's nice to know you got options, you know, and it's like, you really have to research this shit. So if you have a place in mind, don't just assume, oh, you know, I'll work it out, I'll just throw money at the problem. Because in some cases they really hate outside investment, and it's because a wealthy outsider could technically buy up all of the land in that country because the land is priced so cheaply because it's a communist country or something, you know? So they have rules against it. Or it's just a very sparsely populated country, so some wealthy, like, British or American guy could technically go to New Zealand and buy half of New Zealand because it's actually like pretty cheap to buy property and land out there in comparison, you know? And so they have laws to protect that, so I said, you know, it would fuck everything up. <clears throat> A lot of the tropics kind of areas, they kind of let you just buy your way in. Uh, I said, I looked at something like, uh, I think it was gonna mess this up. It was either the, it wasn't the Seychelles, it wasn't the Seychelles. Panama, uh, St. Lucia, I think, Colombia, uh, either Guatemala or Venezuela, a lot of the areas around that kind of thing. Uh, Mauritius, I want to say. I've been Mauritius. Uh, the Bahamas, I think, the Bahamas, or, um, maybe not the Bahamas. Oh, what's the button? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just messing around now. Um, you regain Devil Trigger really quickly with the. Oh, and uh, Portugal, Spain. You can buy your way in and get a permanent visa, and Turkey, I believe. So there are ways to get, if you're a Brit and you're like, oh, fuck Brexit, if you have the money 
you can invest in their country and then basically become a dual citizen and then get your EU citizenship back in that way. Which is probably also why a lot of wealthy middle class fucking people voted to go out because it's like they could probably, it probably wouldn't affect them that much. Just a method to keep millennials down as usual probably. Uh, anyway, let's talk about something less depressing and less boring. I found it interesting because I'm a fucking nerd. <laughs> but, um, yeah. The countries like down in Central and Southeast Asia, they don't give a shit about your driving license. It's fucking awesome. So, like, I actually have a full British driving license and I've kind of. Oh, I got a CBT. <laughs> like, you know, uh, I've got experience. I failed my model on like twice. That's hardly like enough for like driving 600cc bikes, but out in like Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Nepal, they're just like, hey man, just give us some money and, you know, give us some sort of deposit for insurance and uh, off you go. They don't care, man. You can just get on a bike. They don't care. They're like, well, it's up to you. You know what risks you're taking. And there's a lot of people, a lot of traffic, a lot of like what we would consider dangerous driving, but it's just like the way that they drive. It's like, you know, they don't stop, you know, and like they just merge without looking and it's like your responsibility to get out of the way and it's just, yeah, very messy. Anyway, when I was in Nepal, I rented out a bike. I rented out a Royal Enfield actually that was like restored, a bullet, and um, just doing boring shit here, there we go. We'll actually do some cool stuff with uh, Shadow now. Come on Shadow, there we go. I thought I did it. So, um, yeah, I rented out a restored Royal Enfield Bullet in British Racing Green. It was 350cc, I think, may have been a little less. And I, I drove it around when the roads were pretty empty because there was a local like uh, religious festival happening and everyone was just like already at the places that they needed to be for it. You know, like if they were joining people or if they were having it at their home, they would already back home. So it was pretty empty roads. Still quite a lot of traffic because it's always busy in Nepal. I was in Kathmandu. It was fun. I nearly fell off a mountain, <laughs> like uh, I literally drove it up, I got my, like, I literally got the map up from my Lonely Planet guide on my phone, it was like, what's the fastest way to the nearest, um, uh, nearest mountain, and it was like this place, I can't remember the name of it, it was just been raining, the mud was slick, I went halfway up the mountain, found a nice place where there was lots of colorful flags and like statues of Buddha and I just kind of sat there and I looked out over the cliffside and I was like, this is nice, this is nice. And then I tried to bring it back down, I hit a pothole and literally the pothole nearly, like I had to slam the brakes on as I landed out of the pothole because potholes don't fuck around in Nepal, right? And because Nepal Nepal don't fuck around with potholes or mud sliding. It was literally a case of slam on the brakes and literally no guardrail, otherwise. And uh, you just, yeah. Yeah, I, I was like that close from falling off of, <laughs> falling off of a mountain on a rented bike and my first fall was Shit, I can't pay for this bike. <laughs> it's like not like, oh, I don't speak a word of Nepalese. Um, you know, uh, I'm trapped up a mountain, which is about like, uh, was about a half hour drive. So it was like quite a while away. I couldn't have got back on foot. Then I got lost, got caught in a monsoon, nearly got hit by a bus twice, merged into oncoming traffic. <laughs> like it was awesome. Uh, yeah, I got sunburned and drenched through on the same thing, and like, they were, when, when I came back and dropped off the bike, he was like, oh man, did you have fun? And I was like, yeah, and it was like, I was soaked. Like, I tried to take shelter for a while, but I was drenched through. 
and it's that kind of tropical rain where you're not getting cold really, but you are a bit like, oh, I am like, oh, like my my clothes are saturated. <clears throat> it was a great experience, but like I'm surprised I didn't die. <laughs> like you know. Yeah, so that was a fun time. I really want to go. I I pussied out the last time I went to Chiang Mai. Uh, they had bikes for rent. Chiang Mai was pretty chill. It wasn't too busy on the roads. Way less busy than Hanoi or Kathmandu was. But, I mean, you know, those places are kind of bigger than Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai was fun. Lots of temples. Uh, I went and saw an elephant. You know, fed the elephant, touched the elephant, pet the elephant. All that sort of thing. And uh, I was just doing it for like the sheer, like I've never been to Thailand, I wanted to see everything, I wanted to try the food, because I love Thai food, but I'd never been to Thailand, so I was like, oh, i got to try the food now, man. And like, yeah, I should have rented a bike. On the, like, I was walking around, and I felt like I was wasting a lot of time going around, uh, you know, just walking when I could have just been like buzzing around like you could just go around on a bike and just see so much stuff and like they were just renting them out to anybody. So next time I go to Thailand I'll probably do that unless I'm going to Bangkok because I'm scared that the traffic will be too much for me. Uh, yeah but that does really make me think oh man I want to go live in these countries because it's like I don't have to do much to get like a motorcycle and just drive. They're, they're not going to sit there and go, oh yeah, you're not allowed to drive it, you don't have this stuff, they just kind of leave you to, to your own devices and don't really care, man. So it's just like, you know, I think that like, I have enough experience that I know how to ride a bike, but I need more experience to get good at it, like really comfortable behind it. And like, I think the best way for me to do that is just to have as much on-road experience as possible. And then maybe if I ever go back to the UK for a short period, just like, let's just do this. Um, pretty cool whoever's doing the style announcements for V that was quite a like I don't know whose voice that was Let's see if we can get oh, no, I fucked it up. Uh, anyway uh, oh I'm on him shit I forgot I could do that Domination. No, that's not domination. Let's just get off. I think he can do a better job than I can. I've forgotten his uh, moveset. I don't really ever control Nightmare directly. It's actually quite advantageous to like control him sometimes, because you know if you had a plan, it's like, oh, I brought in uh, Nightmare and he didn't do the thing I wanted him to do, you can just force him to do it, but like, um, <coughs> And you don't take damage when you're on his back. But yeah, if you, if you wanted to just have a lot of time to just practice, I mean, it can be dangerous, but it's like, it's good experience to like, for road driving. And then it's like, you know, you're going to be really confident on a British road if you ever go back, or like an American road, or like a New Zealand or Canadian road, uh, or Australian road when you're back in the... Uh, your home country after your time in Asia to just do your license. So uh, that's my plan. And you get loads of great stories, like I was just saying. Um, yeah. Thailand was fun. Thailand is like shocking, however, it is with the stuff. Like I think I may have mentioned before, um, I am so naive. I sat down in a bar and I was propositioned by a bar girl and I was just so embarrassed and I didn't even realize that was happening for the good five 
fucking like good hour or so of me chatting to her. I just thought she was just some friendly girl. Everyone was just looking at me like, uh huh. And I was just so like kind of awkward about it because it's just like, oh man, I do, I wouldn't do that kind of thing. No offense, <coughs> like to people who would or to the industry. It's just not my kind of thing. But like, um, <clears throat> that is everywhere, um, all over Asia, and it's kind of awkward because yeah, like. It tells you a lot about people, let me just say, like, you meet people, man, and, like, every, like, you want to know the reality of what people are like, and you want to, like, uh, you want to actually know how, like, what, where your morals of your friends lie, and you, you're, like, particularly bothered about that stuff, I don't know. I mean, for me, I don't give a shit, so it's like, you know. But like, you know, it's really interesting talking to other expats and realizing that a lot of these expats, they don't give a shit, man. And it's like, fair enough. Like, you know, do whatever you want. But like, um, I was just like, there will be, there were like guys who were coming with their girlfriends straight out of uni in Hong Kong. Who were like, oh, this will be a nice experience, won't it? Yeah, this will be great. Yeah, me and him are doing really well. And he was cheating on her with like three different Asian girls the whole time. And seeing prostitutes and shit. And you would just be like, that was like not just one person. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? That was a few people. And I was just like, wow. These people think they're so above people like me because I do this as an actual job. Like, this is my job. I don't do it to find myself for a few years and then go off and become, a, like, an orthodontist or something. I, like, this is my job. Like, I decided at one point the travel element's fun and shit. This is basically my job. I, I can't be bothered to go back to the UK. I like to be out in different places. I have a short attention span. I like to travel, so it's an excuse for all of that. And I love, I love foreign food. I love trying different things. Especially Latin American and Asian food, I really like that stuff, so it's an excuse to see that and see the culture and shit. The amount of people I meet who are like, <laughs> yeah, I heard prostitution's legal here, and you're like, Don't, uh, didn't you come here with your girlfriend? And they're like, what does that matter? And you're like, wow, oh, you're that kind of guy, wow, okay. Oh, shit, no, no, no. Yes. Yes. I did it. I dib it. But uh, all my other guys didn't dib it. Eh. Save the guy. Yeah. Save the guy. Save the guy. Save the guy. Yeah. 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 Woo. Eh. Oh, that was a bouncy one. Good job I reacted late. Let's spike this guy. Yeah, chunky, chunky damage. So yeah, like you see a lot of shit, and it's just like wow. The like the pe all the people that you think are good people, they're the worst, man. <laughs> like you know, people who you think are sleaze bags, they're just like oh yeah, yeah, I guess that exists, and they completely ignore it. It's always the people who look like perfect little white boys who have come off their little geography degree. You know what I mean? And they're like, oh, I'm going to see the world and find myself. Oh, yes, my daddy works in a fucking, like, my daddy's a lawyer or something. They're the sleaziest motherfuckers on the planet. <laughs> like, you know, you meet guys who do it as a job. <clears throat> or guys who are teachers and stuff. And they're just, like, um, you know, like, properly qualified, doing it for years in their home country. Teachers who then decided to just move out and do it somewhere else because we don't get paid very well sometimes. Um, yeah, you really start to like see, you know, like, these people. And man, it's always the little pretty white boys in their early 20s who are the most fucked up people on the planet. <laughs> like, you know, every time, man. They're the ones who are getting into street fights outside fucking Chinese bars at two in the morning over some girl who left hours ago. They're the guys who are like taking all of the drugs 
they're the guys that are like trying to like basically subjugate the local women like i met one guy and he was literally hitting girls in front of me and i stopped hanging out with him because i was like dude i'm not dealing with this and he was just treating the local women like they're shit and i was just like no one else gonna talk about how this guy <laughs> was uh is the biggest piece of shit on the planet are we just not gonna talk about that oh teleport was in the crater and like to this day he still works at the same place i used to work at and oh my fucking god he got into street fights with guys who are like man i don't care i'm drunk let me go home they would go home and he'd follow them home and they'd have to like jujitsu throw him on the ground put their knee on his belly and say you're drunk mate go home because he never took the fucking hint that he's not special he was one of these guys who was like, oh, I did karate for a few years and thinks he's all that. And he was just like, he was also the guy who was literally hitting women all of the time and thought it was an appropriate thing to say in a bar. And like two or three times I just got up, you know, and just walked out. So I was just like, I ain't, I ain't dealing with this shit, man. Like, I don't want to be associated with guys like that. I fucking, re like, I respect women. I refuse to treat them that poorly. That's disgusting. Um, horrible man, and it was like this chick that we worked with, and he was just like trying to fuck her the whole time, and she was like, I have a boyfriend, and they just kept pressuring her into having sex with him, and I was just like, dude, you really gotta like, he's really nasty as well, he was like grabbing her and shit, and whenever we were with her, he, she was looking at people like me and the other guys, and just like, help me. And every time we tried to talk to her, he'd put himself between us, and he'd, like, straight up hit her in front of me multiple times, and I'd be like, whoa, what the fuck, dude? And he'd just, like, try and... And I was just sat there, like, no one else was reacting to it, and it made me feel like, am I just seeing things? Am I going insane? Have I been out here too long? And I was like, no, those people were just too, like, awkward and ashamed to say anything. And I was just like... In the end, I ended up not hanging out with those people. <clears throat> And I was just like, dude, I ain't talking to you anymore. <clears throat> Real fucked up people. And that's the thing. Some people need rules. And when you go out and you're an expat in these countries, they pre-treat you like you're a criminal or they ignore you entirely. And some people need to have rules. Because <laughs> it's those people, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. Oh, fuck. Let's just do this the room a bit. Is that all on? Okay, mostly bats, so I don't really need to pull Nightmare out. But, trivialize that room. Oh. Don't do it! Do it! Do it, you bish! Oh. I pressed the wrong button for, like, Griffin. He was supposed to swoop in to knock that guy out and stun him. If you don't do that, he does that big curse bomb shit, and it just fucks you up. Yeah, like, <clears throat> really horrible, man. And you meet some people out here, and they just think they can live without consequence. <clears throat> and it takes, like, people with strong moral compasses, really, to survive in these kind of countries, because... Some people, man, it really is a case if you give them an ounce of temptation and just say, hey man, you can just go and be a fucking rapist out here and no one's gonna do nothing about it. They will. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, fuck. You know? It takes a certain kind of mentality to put up with it. And it's like, it's always the pretty boys. It's always the pretty boys who think they're all that and are pretend that they're intelligent, that are like the biggest scum on the planet. Like, they think women exist for them to dominate and shit, and, like, treat them like crap, and just take drugs and think they're above the law, and, like, literally, in some cases, say things that make you think, holy shit, they genuinely think that they're racially superior as well. Oh, God. You know? Like, they've been given everything their whole life, they come from a wealthy background, and some guys I spoke to, man, they were like, oh, when I go back, I'm gonna become, like, I'm gonna move up the ranks in the police and shit. And you're like, I seriously hope that you don't, because people like you don't deserve to be in charge of anything important. 
but they will be because they're pretty and they're white boys and no one knows about the time they raped seven people in China. You know what I mean? Like, it's fucked up. And if you don't think that's happening, you're blind. Some of these people, man, they think, oh, when in Asia, doesn't matter, no one will know about it. If I get deported, I just tell them it was a mistake and they, oh, miscarriage of justice, you know them Asians. And you're like, good. <laughs> okay, sure, mate. Guys, man, like, guys that are nearly hitting 40 who still think that they're all that and still think that they're pretty trying to have sex with my girlfriend who's like 22 because I was like 24 or 25 at the time and um, just trying to bother her all of the time and shit or like um, uh, like doing and those kind of guys still like doing shit like ketamine and still like massive credit card debt and demanding the employers to pay off the credit card debt and you were just like oh my god like no no, you've got to have your, you've got to have a belief system. Like, it doesn't have to be a religion. It can be any sort of, like, inner working which says, Hey man, I don't think that that's what my role models would think was acceptable. You know what I mean? If you're, like, you got someone, like, in your brain that you, like, see as a father figure or something, or your own parents or something, whatever's your thing, you know, or you just think that's not very metal of you to do that, like metal's about inclusion, or like whatever your attitude is, like maybe you're like a Buddhist, or like you're a Christian, or you're a Satanist, or something, and you just go, that's not, that's against my way of thinking, I don't think that's the right way to treat people. Because the rules of Satanism are very like clear on this stuff, they're like very clear that you shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't ever harm certain people. And you should really only harm people if they're going to harm you and it's a self-defense measure, you know what I mean? Very clear. And that's pretty much exactly what the Christian Bible says. So they actually got quite a lot of similarity in their core tenets. It's just written slightly differently. And then obviously the whole theology behind it after that's like the complete opposite. <laughs> like Satan is cool, not Jesus. Um, that's basically it. Depends on which sect you follow of Satanism, but I'm not talking about religion today. Or like Buddhism is similar, you don't harm other people, you try and help them. Uh, you know, a lot of religions focus on this because it's a good thing to be focusing on. A lot of people, man, that I work with, they, they're godless motherfuckers in every sense of the word, you know? <laughs> and I'm not going to be like, you all need Jesus, because I'm not that kind of guy, I don't believe in God, but like, they need something. <laughs> they need something, man. <laughs> like, they need time. Fucked up people, man. And these people then go back to the, like their home countries, you know? And they go and fill up certain groups of people. They're like, in society. I'm not in society, and I wouldn't do shit like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? No matter where I am. Like, and yeah, the temptation's there. That's all I would say. A lot of people are like, oh, but why would that happen? Because you were literally approached in bars. You know what I mean? People, like, it's not like the UK where it's like, you can get drugs if you look, or if you know. It's, guy comes up to you in a bar when you're drunk and says, hey man, you look like you're having fun, do you want more drugs? <laughs> Are you bored of alcohol? How about meth? <laughs> like, guys will do that. Happens to me all the time in Hong Kong. I'd be wandering around drunk at like, maybe only like 10, 11 p.m. at night going home actually because I was just like nah man I don't feel like it today and this guy would come up to me be like hey man you want some cocaine and I'm like who the fuck are you <laughs> well, you know it's there and that's not just drugs like I can tell you some real dang shit man for example you know the whole like cucking shit yeah we're gonna go there we're gonna go there <laughs> time that with that stab yeah, you know there's that whole craze in the West of cucking shit and it's a whole thing? Yeah, it's a thing here. I had a chick in Hong Kong and had a poor choice of words. I didn't. I worked with a chick in Hong Kong, a really nice lady actually. Uh, I'll keep her name like out of this, <laughs> uh, like I do with everything. Um, yeah, <laughs> she was talking to me, she was, she was really pretty, 
she was a lot older than I was, but it, she she was very tomboyish and she held it really well. She was still really pretty, um, really strong, really powerful, like sexy lady in terms of she knows what she wants kind of thing. I knew her daughter because I taught her like or something at like one of the schools. This this isn't the only case of this, but it's very much a case of this happens. This happens a lot. It happens a lot more, and most people don't say no. Um, never heard him say that one. Oh, yeah, they're doing the beam. Apocalypse Falls. Very metal. Sounds like a Trivium song, but maybe I'm thinking of Vengeance Falls. Uh, anyway, yeah, she told me that she was a single parent, and I was like, oh, okay, that's nice, thinking, like, trying to actually get out of the conversation, because, like, I'm not in a position in my life to stay, take on the, uh, take on a, like, child and be a father figure. I'm, I'm too fucked up. <laughs> like, I'm too fucked up. <laughs> I don't want kids of my own. I definitely don't want to start adopting kids and stuff, because I just don't think I'm there, you know? Like, I just don't think I'm a good option for people. I would be a terrible parent. Having worked with kids my whole life, I kind of know that I'm just not ready to make a full-time commitment to them. Work is enough, you know? So anyway, she was like, you know, kind of talking to me and stuff, and I was like, yeah, she's nice. She's a friend. She's nothing else. And she was like, oh yeah, you want to come out to dinner sometime? And I was like, yeah, sure. Nice to find some new places that the locals actually eat at, so you know you're getting the authentic stuff, quote unquote. And, um, yeah, I was eating at this Cantonese restaurant, and this guy comes in and sits down at our table, and I'm like, who's this? And he doesn't speak a word of English. And, yeah, that was her husband. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that, that was a thing that happened, and he paid for everything, but he looked pretty miffed. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know how much he knows, but how much he knows, because he didn't speak a word of English. He's just being really polite, because he knows that's the thing to do. And I felt like I was a bartering chip, you know, in a messy... Because she was referring to him as not her husband, just the father of her kid. And I said, but let's be real, are you still married to him? And she was like, yeah, and I still live with him. So I'm like, so, and he, so he's still your husband, but you still live with him? She was like, yeah. I was like, so you can see why I felt uncomfortable. <laughs> And she, like, I texted her a few days later after going out with one of my friends. Uh, I was drinking and I got back at like 7 in the morning because bars stay open late out here. And I was just up all night drunk while my mate was like absolutely smashed out on his life on cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't do that stuff. It's just, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea for me to be on drugs or even on alcohol because I'm just a mess. Um, as it is, I'm just crazy uh so yeah i never do that stuff but like um he was like very messed up that night oh he was actually pretty chill you know he, he knows his coke use um <laughs> what am i saying this story and like i called her like that following morning because i thought you know what i should talk to her you know i said to her like you know okay uh and like the nine-year-old the kid was in on it like, that's what's so messed up. She was, like, really, like, in on it. She knew. She was like, geez, man, get with it. Wake up. To me, basically. Like, you know, get with it. My mum wants to get with you. <laughs> and I was just like, all right. Uh, yeah. So I text her, and I just said, hey, so what's going on? Are you, like, trying to, like, so is this what, like, am I reading this right kind of thing? And she just basically sent me back a text saying, Oh yeah, you can have me whenever you want, if you want. I was just like, okay, not what, not the response I wanted, kind of thing. And it made like being her friend very difficult after that, as you can imagine. So yeah, you can imagine if I was a different guy with different values, and I don't really like believe in marriage. I'm not really a big marriage guy, but I'm aware that I will ruin another guy's life if I just start sleeping with his wife. Like I'm not an idiot. <laughs> you know, um, like, just because I don't want to get married and because I don't value those traditions because they, 
steeped in Christian bullshit doesn't mean that, like, I think it's fine, because other people value those things, you know? Like, it still has a legal standing as well. Um, you know, it's wrong. In terms of, like, if they're not okay with it, it's not fine. <laughs> like, you know, if he's like, yeah, man, cool, just sleep with my wife, then I guess that's a different story, and that's whether or not I'm comfortable with it then. But then they're still like, I wouldn't be comfortable with it, as you can imagine. <laughs> so, um, long story short, I said no, but that is not the only case of that happening. I've heard multiple friends have hear it happen. The job I'm at now, uh, I teach this kid, I teach literally her kid every day. He doesn't really like me. <laughs> this makes it even more awkward. Um, Hard to hit them with the skewer this one. But like, if you do it just one shot them. But they keep moving. Oh. When did Griffin die? I wonder why. I was like, where's my pew pews? My little pews. Um makes that easier when you have the aerial counter. Uh yeah, so like that's not like there's a mum at the work that I'm at now, who the first time she met me, she was like, he's cute, and she just, like, texts me all the time, <laughs> it just makes me really uncomfortable, so it's regular, like, that stuff happens, I work with, like, Chinese girls, almost predominantly, because, like, it's the kindergarten industry, so it's majorly, like, female-dominated, like, the only other men you'll meet are normally, like, the janitor is a 60-year-old man, the, you know, the principal's a woman, everyone's a woman. Uh, except for, like, other English teachers. And, like, you were hit on all of the time in a way that we would be considered sexual harassment. <laughs> like, you know, it's just because we're men that it's not considered sexual harassment, you know? People are like, oh, well, why would you care? You're a man. You're always up for sex, right? Wrong! <laughs> like, when it's a 50-year-old lady who's your boss, yay. Wrong! <laughs> like, you know, I am not up for sex then. <laughs> up, up for sex with a girl who's single and interesting and is my tastes, you know? Like, somebody who I'm, like, attracted to on a basis of relationship. <laughs> I don't just have sex with everybody. Anyway, um, there's a, there's a mum of somebody that I teach who tried to get with me here. Several of the teachers, when I first started, were telling me how much they hate their husbands and then adding right onto the end of that, wow, you have nice eyes though, <laughs> things like this. And one of them, when we were doing some team building thing and it was some sort of trust fall style exercise, my hands landed on her shoulders and she leant back and whispered in my ear, hold me. <laughs> now, I took that as a joke because there was other people in the room, but that made me feel very uncomfortable, as you can imagine. That's not even the worst sexual harassment I've received. Oh, okay, I've got low battery, so I'm just going to pause this a second and move this over here because I'm nowhere near finished talking about dank bullshit. <laughs> uh, professional. Oh, sorry, babe. Just ripped jeans of my cat. Let's see if we can get this sound balancing okay as well, so like, you can hear the music. I'm using Virgil 2 for like, B, because spoilers, I don't even need to tell you now. This game came out a while ago, I didn't realize, because I've been playing it since it came out. I'm just like, yeah, it's fun, and I'm like, oh, I've been playing this for like a year, <laughs> like, you know, several times, of course. So anyway, um... I might have to change the sound levels, it's quite loud now. I'm just going to the speaker a little bit back rather than changing levels. So, um, yeah. It's not even the worst harassment I had. I've had a lot of harassment. <laughs> I get a lot of it because I'm fairly quiet at work and I'm average looking. I'm like in my late 20s now. Oh, no. No! No! 
Oh, look at the Ducati monster on my screen. You, know, you, you can't really see it, all the windows are open. Oh. Oh, no, it doesn't even pause. Oh. Oh, we're going to have to. It's jittering like crazy now, just because I moved. Uh, the music's dipping in and out and shit. Oh, please stabilize. Oh, I think it's just the beat. <laughs> I'm, wow. I was like, oh god, the sound's cutting in and out, and it's just the rhythm section cuts in and out on this. It's good. And I was like, oh god, it's like regularly cutting in and out. It's fine, it's fine. So, yeah, we're just going to talk about how I was constantly quite badly harassed <laughs> in my workplaces. You get a lot of girls who, like, they think it's flirting, and it's really not. You know, it's just like, okay, you're making me uncomfortable now. You know. Please get the message. So you can still do that counter with uh, V there. That you saw me do it on the scissors, the deaf scissors, which is like a hilarious name. Everyone else has a demon name. Deaf scissors. Okay. It's like Spider Mastermind in Doom. Oh man, I'm so looking forward to Doom coming out. <clears throat> so yeah, let's just talk openly about how sexual harassment towards men in the workplace is still sexual harassment, and it's not, ha ha ha, you should just fucking deal. No, that's still harassment. That is still like making me uncomfortable and feeling me pressured into having sex with you. Yeah, it's much easier for me to say no. I don't feel like they're going to follow me home and rape me, so there's that. <laughs> but like, it's still a bit like, um, this is annoying me and upsetting me and making me feel like please stop and I might be a bit melodramatic about it because it's like you know I'm getting I'm quite a paranoid person but you know like um it is a bit like okay I have had stalkers in the past let's say that and you think a guy as average as me really yeah I've had stalkers in the past you know, you think, oh, well, that, it must be easy to get a girlfriend. No, because they're all fucking creeps. <laughs> like, you know. A lot of them don't know how to fucking speak to men over here. So they just act like psychos. And case in point in a minute. Oh. Oh, these guys again. Just going to turn down the volume a second. There we go. I'm scared that the sound's really loud now. Uh, yeah, I had genuine stalkers. I've had women straight up, like, physically harass me at work, like, literally press themselves up against me in lewd ways. So I'm going to tell this story. So I, I don't feel discomfort about it, and I don't feel, like, shell-shocked from it, because I'm just like, oh, you know, that's hilarious. Like, you know, because, you know, I'm not going to feel threatened, because I'm lucky. Because, like, you know, I'm a fairly big guy, and I'm just like, I can just say no, and no, nothing will happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm fine. There is that. But it's still, harassment is harassment. You shouldn't feel uncomfortable or unsafe at work when you're just trying to do your job. And someone who's married, of all people, is doing this shit to you, you know? But this example, she wasn't married. She was 23. Bit awkward. Didn't know how to talk to guys. Nerdy Asian girl. She was wearing TA for one of my classes in one of my first jobs. Uh, I hope she doesn't listen to this because she's going to be so embarrassed. I still talk to her sometimes because, like, you know, we actually still have a good relationship slash, well, friendship because she's a nice girl. She just hit me at a bad time in my life, and I didn't really want to, like, be in a relationship right then, especially just, like, I was just feeling like I just wanted some time alone. Come out of a rough relationship with a girl who looked roughly like her, and, uh, yeah, just really didn't want to go through that shit again straight away like you know I just you know how relationships be sometimes uh yeah so this girl waited until the classes had finished basically everyone had gone home we had one of the latest classes in the um 
school, most teachers and staff had gone home. It was dark. It was raining, <laughs> like, you know, outside. And she turned the lights off, and I was picking up flashcards. Uh, because I was just like, oh, yeah, you know, like, um, and she's going to cringe so hard if she hears this, because I think she's just kind of accepted that nothing happened, and she's a bit awkward about what she was like back then. But, like, um, you know, like, it was weird and kind of, I think it's funny now, but, like, I'm just going to make you all feel unpleasant about this. So, like, I was picking up flashcards, which means I was on my knees picking up flashcards because we'd just done a game where they all threw them on the floor at the end or they were jumping around, picking them up, you know. It was like a running game. I was at a learning center, so, you know, that kind of explains a lot of flashcard, a lot of flashcard games in learning centers. Anyway, this girl turns off the lights, and while I'm on my knees, literally sits on my face. <laughs> like, literally. Like, to the point that literally her vagina is in my face, and I can, like, feel it, <laughs> like, you know, she's pressing herself against me, yeah, so it gets bad, it gets bad out here, oh, no, no, I'm gonna lose now, this is bad, man, I might have to stop, and also spare you all from my horrible dank stories, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna die now, oh, no, 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 oh, no, 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 oh, why is it so bad? I think it's because I've been on it for so long. China's like, no, you can't tell stories about all of the times. Because they, like, Chinese men fucking hate it. <laughs> like, Chinese men fucking hate that, like, Asian girls, like, Chinese girls, oh, fuck's sake. This is probably not doable, you know. It's fucking bullshit. I want to finish my story, though. I'm gonna let it stabilize while I finish my story. I'm gonna lose this fight now. Because I'm just taking hits that I don't need to take because the game is just lagging so long. I'm pressing the pause button and it wouldn't let me pause. Fuck you. <laughs> like, that was bullshit. And that's a remote place fault and China. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Start, you fuck. Oh, I'm sweaty now. Because it's overheating. Everything's overheating trying to deal with this shit. So anyway, we're going to finish this story. I don't give a shit. <laughs> like, so yeah, this happened a few times with this chick. She tried to like, she couldn't speak to me. She was so shy around me, she couldn't speak to me. But she decided the best option was to literally just shove her genitals in my face. And she did that a few times. Well, she did that. And then a few times she got me alone in an office and stuff and pressed herself up against the wall and said, Hey, now that we're alone, it really like showed, showed me everything kind of thing. And like it made me feel pretty uncomfortable, as you can imagine. <laughs> and like I knew she was crushing on me super hard, but it made me feel real bad, <laughs> you know? Uh, at the time, and I was just like, especially because I was coming out of a shitty relationship with another Chinese, mm. Chinese chick. So yeah, Chinese guys fucking hate it because they hate the idea that Chinese women are like hitting on foreign men at all. They get really touchy about it, and they like, oh yeah, because there's a lot of like stigma about it. I'm not going to go into the politics of that, but like um. I, I'm not drawing the attention, right? Like I've said in all of my stories, I'm actually quite a quiet guy at work. I don't really, like, do anything. And then all of these, like, married women and parents and, like, mums, mostly, obviously, and, like, uh, like all of those people, like, um, what's my name? Oh, the lag man. I was hoping to record something else today, but I probably won't be able to. Or even play Wolfenstein. Yeah, so, um, it's bad. Like, 